Welcome to Be Provided Conservation Radio, sharing stories and information about the environment, wildlife, and the people who are dedicating their lives to protect the world for future generations. These inspirational stories will take you from the Santa Cruz Mountains to remote areas of Africa. Here are your hosts. Hello and welcome back to Be Provided Conservation Radio. I'm really interested in the work our guest today is doing because I feel the animals he is working with kind of fly or slither under the radar of conservation. They need to be known about and appreciated. So our guest today is Michael G. Starkey. He's a conservation biologist, ecological consultant, and public speaker working to educate and involve the public in wildlife conservation issues. Michael has a diverse background in the field of wildlife conservation and has worked as an ecological consultant for environmental consulting firms and governmental agencies, such as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He has worked with a wide diversity of wildlife, including the San Francisco garter snakes, giant garter snakes, California tiger salamanders, bats, ringtails, and Yucatan black howler monkeys. Michael has developed and implemented community-based conservation initiatives, which focus on the protection of wildlife populations in Belize, Ghana, and India. Michael is a co-founder of Save the Snakes and serves as the executive director. He uses his knowledge of snake ecology, positive attitude to inspire, and enthusiasm for snake conservation to engage the public with protecting these beautiful animals. He gives presentations around the world to inform the public about the threats facing wildlife and to help nurture a society that respects and appreciates nature and wildlife. What a great diverse background, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank thank you so much. It's such an honor to have this opportunity. So thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed uh, meeting you at the Wildlife Conservation Network Expo, um, which is always mind blowing to me. But you know, it, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say it's, it, it always inspires me when I leave that event and uh, helps me with the work that we're doing to protect snakes. Oh, good, good. Yeah. And, you know, from your background, I imagine you as a young Michael or a young boy always outside lifting logs and things to find all sorts of critters and your parents had to drag you indoors as it got dark outside. Am I kind of spot on on that? You know, it's, it's actually funny you say that, yeah. but as a, as a child, I was actually a little disconnected from nature. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. And it was, um, so for me growing up, I grew up in, in Sacramento, California. I grew up in the city. Um, my connection to wildlife was, I mean, well, not wildlife it was just animals, pets. Oh, okay. um, and so growing up actually was, uh, you know, I just had a fondness for uh, having pets and then uh, eventually somehow grew an interest in reptiles, probably from a typical young child's fascination of dinosaurs. <laughs> and my parents allowed me to keep some lizards, which then became snakes and frogs. And uh, but it wasn't until my uh, actually 19 when I decided that I wanted to work with these animals professionally. Um, and then that's actually what kind of got me to go out into nature and find these animals. Uh, yeah, but started off with not really being that connected to nature, but it was just always a love of animals and loving animals that people really didn't like, like snakes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There, you know, I grew up not really uh, hating snakes, but I was afraid of snakes. Um, it wasn't until just probably 10 years ago that I really started to appreciate their beauty and, and use and appreciate them more. So, yeah. And that's actually uh, kind of a universal thing with <laughs> snakes. Uh, it's either you, you have a, there really is no one out there that doesn't have an opinion of snakes. Uh, they, they're an animal that you either really like, or you may fear them. So they're very strong, you know, kind of emotions that people feel about these animals. Uh, but with most of probably the human population being afraid of snakes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's kind of embedded in all, you know, old mythology as well. And old, you know, these these kind of scary things that you relate to with either witches or whatever, you know, and, and it's kind of embedded in <laughs> well, all, you know, back really far into our history that, not, yeah. you know, it's 
the first story we hear about in you know the the Christian Bible, for example, oh, is right? the snake is. I mean, that's that's how that story <laughs> begins, right? Right, right. So, you know, and so, so some religions may not have the best view of snakes for that reason, but you know, if you look around the world, you know, there's um, a religious sect of, in Hinduism that actually worships snakes. They have a, a snake god, uh, and also the uh, Aboriginal people of Australia have a cre- a beautiful creation story of this rainbow serpent, which actually you know, sculpted the valleys and created the rivers with its body. Um, and so, you know, mythology does play a big role in snakes, some positive, some negative. Mm-hmm. But we kind of, we hold that true as we get older. And, you know, it's this, there's a big debate whether uh, fear of snakes is actually something that's ingrained in our biology. You know, when we were primates coming out of the trees and we had to be alert seeing snakes in the savannas of Africa, okay. that there might be an argument there. True. But definitely most of it is, is nurture. Um, we, we, our parents tell us to be afraid of snakes. Uh, Hollywood is not very snake friendly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, in, Indiana Jones, you know, right? right. Like, why did it have to be snakes? <laughs> um, and so this plays a big, um, I guess uh, it has a role in perpetuating these kind of negative stereotypes about snakes. And uh, a lot, most of it, again, is an un. Not, not, not the reality of how uh, snakes actually live and survive. You know, snakes aren't out there to get us or right. trick us or deceive us. But yeah, yeah, I agree. And yeah, well, I grew up the same way. Like going camping, uh, you know, the fear. You know, I was told, you know, you got to be really careful. A snake's going to seek you out and crawl into your sleeping bag for warmth. <laughs> you know, and it, it kept me from backpacking for a long time. <laughs> So. You know, it's, some of these things, I wonder, I do wonder how they happen because there are these, these kind of like, oh, you have to be careful because the rattlesnake might, you know, I don't know. And, and usually it just starts as one situation that gets blown out of proportion and then, you know, it kind of gets passed down. Like, for example, there in the Southeast, there, you know, people will, will claim that, you know, copper, or not copper heads, uh, cotton mouse or water moccasins, a, a venomous pit viper, they will chase you and they will chase you far. And that is um, is just a myth that lasts today. There are myths about those snakes jumping out of trees or, you know, and it's, again, these are just probably circumstances that um, kind of get blown out of proportion. And thus, as they're passed down, it's like telephone, right? You know, right. The story changes or um, there's another problem with snakes getting larger in stories. You know, that rattlesnake was, you know, seven feet long when probably it was just, you know, three and a half feet. Or yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I found, you know, in my research for this interview, you know, looking at your information on Save the Snakes, um, that 12% of the snake species are only listed, you know, are listed as threatened, which is is quite a bit. But I guess I should say 12% of the assessed snake species and assess being that there's, there's probably 62%. I think your website said that that aren't assessed yet. And, yeah. and that number might have changed recently because yeah. the, so those numbers are based off the IUCN uh, right. and their assessment of reptiles as whole. And there was just this report that was done by uh, Manga Bay, which is a you know, excellent uh, environmental news mm-hmm. group. They 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 released this report. It's a little old. I think it was from like 2012 or something. Okay. But what what the big takeaway is that most of the world's reptile species have not been assessed by the IUCN. It's it's upwards about 60 percent. Wow. Um, and that's that's a problem <laughs> because if we don't know what are the conservation you know needs of many of these species, we can't even begin to address them. Um, and so that's why most of the reptile species that we know of are data deficient. And so that that's that's tough um, mm-hmm. because then it makes trying to figure out, OK, well, are our snakes in a lot of trouble or are they doing OK? Um, but, yeah, that 12 percent number is that's just a threatened species. And that's yeah, again, it's not too many. But it, when we don't know so much about the other species, it's it's it is kind of an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. But kind of the other big takeaway is that it, it paints a bigger picture about how reptile conservation in general is is lacking and that there's not a lot of attention paid to it um you know there isn't except from turtles turtles um there is a turtle extinction crisis and Mm -hmm. turtles are and tortoises are in a lot of um in jeopardy but um it snakes did not really get that you know they're one of these other animals that are definitely looked over um and it makes them because of this lack of knowledge again not only can we not figure out these conservation 
needs, but, you know, tack on to it that about 18% of the world's snake species are highly venomous right. um, that come into conflict with people. People don't want to save them. It It's really, really difficult situation. You know, we don't know what's happening to snakes around the world. And we're advocating for a group of animals that people are you know, highly you know, concerned about living near them, uh, living around communities and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where we're at. It's, okay. it's tough. And so that's sort of where our organization has kind of found itself. We, you know, we are actually, we're a really new organization founded in 2017, but we have to find this balance between, you know, uh, addressing the needs of threatened, already established threatened snake populations but also mitigating human scent conflict, right? And so finding right. that balance in between is, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Like we talked about, the, the snakes are kind of creepy to a lot of people, and it's mm-hmm. hard to get that appreciation. I should, I should mention to our listeners that IUCN, in case you don't know, is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And so they list, um, I think they list threatened species, endangered, um, that, you know, uh, different species of different animals all over the world. So, so how many, how many species of snakes do you think there are? I was kind of surprised when you said only 18% are venomous. I mean, that's not high really. So no, it's, it's really not. And, and so, and that, that actually is even a debated number okay. uh, because this idea of what is venomous and what is not is debated among scientists. And so there's about, 3,600 species of snakes that we know. Of. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So we're still discovering new species. You know, we live in a time where scientists are traveling the world and, um, you know, scientists are exploring new parts of the world. And so we're, um, yeah, so we're basically, we're cataloging new species quite often, but we're right about 3,600. And that 18%, um, that comes from species of snakes that are considered medically significant. And I like that term it's kind of funny to me but it's actually very serious it basically means if you get bitten by one of these snakes you need to go to a hospital or receive some sort of uh, medical care and you know but the reality is is that there are different types of venom there are different types of uh, venom um, basically you know production in the terms of how or excuse me um, venom delivery systems right? right so you know yeah we think of like cobras and vipers they have you know the the typical fangs that are like hypodermic needles. Right. But there are many snake species, including garter snakes, which are some a snake that people think are you know, totally harmless, which they are. Yeah. But they are technically a venomous species because they have a, um, a, a very small venom gland in the back of their mouth that does administer a venom. They're a rear fanged uh, snake. Yeah, and so there are many species like like that, that these very, very, very mild venoms, but it's not, it's not like they have fangs. It's just, um, the, the other venom is just kind of excreted through their saliva. Um, and this is very common when we see snakes that, you know, live around, uh, amphibians or eat fish, you know, they need to subdue that in quick moving prey, um, so they can, you know, survive. Right. And eat it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Wow. So can you talk more, um, you founded, uh, you co-founded actually Save the Snakes in 2017. Um, but you, it sounds like you have a number of partners all over the world, you know, working with you on this. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about the organization and what you guys? Yeah. Are doing? Yeah. So, so basically um, I'll actually give a little backstory about why Save the Snakes exists and oh, good. sort of how it, it came to be. And so in 2015, I was very, very fortunate to be selected to a, um, a wildlife conservation leadership program called Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leaders. It's a fantastic um, uh, program. It's a two-year-long program that accepts conservationists from around the world to develop a conservation project and to learn skills, uh, basically in wildlife conservation. And uh, it's a really life-changing um, program, which it was for me, and definitely because this is how Save the Saints came to be. But there was another gentleman that was accepted in the program from India named Murthy Kant Mahanti, mm-hmm. and he founded his own organization called the Eastern Ghats Wildlife Society, which is based in South India. Okay. Yeah, and so when we were, we first went to this program together, they would basically uh, send us to Florida for um, a, a meeting once a year. 
and we quickly bonded over snakes. We're typical <laughs> snake people, and uh, but we were both working with different, uh, you know, things at the time. Like I was focused on howler monkey conservation in Belize. He was working with fishing cats and other mammals, but we both really, really liked these snakes. And he kind of, um, we had some really good conversations about uh, some of his work and some of the things he's been seeing in South India, which that king cobra is a species that he loves, were being indiscriminately killed in South India. Mm. And he really wanted to address it. There was nothing happening to support the conservation of king cobras, and it was just whenever he would hear about a king cobra found in his area, it was always killed. And so we found a little bit of money and um, we, we wrote a grant and, you know, we raised a little bit for basically to start an awareness project. And it was highly su- successful. He, he went through rural communities in the Eastern Ghats, which is this kind of discontinuous mountain range in South India mm-hmm. along uh, India's Southeast coast. And he started seeing some, you know, some a bit of awareness and he felt like this is something that he could he was interested in doing and it could do good things for king cobra conservation so we looked for some more money and and together we were like okay well let's just do this let's let's start a 501 <laughs> uh sure and take out all that responsibility yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was <laughs> because as you probably know doing that is it's a lot of work it is a and lot so, of work yeah and but, but that's the idea was is that we couldn't we could not raise the money we would need to make this these programs sustainable in South India to get to the point where people were actually not killing king cobras. And so those programs started in 2016. And by 2017, we actually did receive our 501c3 status. Mm. And we launched a website and all of Murthy's programs. Um, we would, you know, put on our website and highlight. And it was great. And so now throughout the Eastern Ghats, there are these snake awareness education programs And what Murthy and his team would do uh, would actually go and train community members to actually rescue snakes. And so if they would give an educational program, for example, you know, uh, for a community, um, some people actually were already removing snakes from people's homes. And so a little bit of a backstory on this, why people might be killing king cobras, is that, you know, 50,000 people a year die in India from snake bites. Oh, wow. Um, it's, yeah. And mm. worldwide, it's about 125, 150,000 people die from snake bite. Mm. Um, uh, last year, 2017, the World Health Organization declared snake bite a neglected tropical disease because there's so little attention paid to snake bite. It's obviously not a disease, but it's on that list of, you know, like dengue and some of these other, you know, Ebola, really terrible diseases. Wow. You know, because there's just so little attention paid to it. And India is sort of this hot spot. You know, you have over a billion people living in close proximity to nature. And so you have snakes, encounters with snakes quite often. And also, it's a tropical country. You have very uh, many venomous snakes. Um, and so by training people in these communities to actually, you know, safely and professionally rescue snakes, they pr- provided a service for their community. And so this is an idea of community-based conservation, right? Mm-hmm. And so by training, you know, these individuals to rescue the snakes, they thus don't kill snakes, hopefully, because the communities where they find snakes, they can say, oh, I can call, you know, Vinesh or, you know, Balaraju to come and get these snakes, um, thus hopefully mitigating the conflict. And the reason for that is because uh, Murthy and his team could not go to these communities where king cobras were being killed and just say, hey, you know, stop killing king cobras and, uh, you know, now we want to save them because king cobras, <laughs> not only are they being killed indiscriminately or highly persecuted, they're losing their habitat. There's um, increased ro- uh, vehicular traffic in South India and yeah. habitat is being carved up. King cobras are getting run over by cars. So they have their own conservation needs. But Murphy could no way go out into those communities and start addressing that. Because the people in that community be like, what? You want to save king cobras? You're crazy. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, but by exactly. doing these awareness programs and training these community members, now he has a great deal of support for his programs. Um, and so, and just to give you an, an idea, um, so 2016, these education awareness programs happened. About three weeks ago, um, one of the uh, landowners, a farmer in South India, actually discovered a king cobra on his property. In the past, would have killed it. But mm-hmm. he called one of the snake rescuers that had been trained by Murthy's team. The snake rescuer went out, got the king cobra, and then successfully released it. 
And so as far as we know, this is the first uh, king cobra that has successfully been rescued and relocated um, in the uh, uh, Vishakapatnam region of South India. Um, and so it was, it was a big milestone for our programs because yeah. it, it was kind of like, oh, we actually are starting to see behavior change. And so, so Murthy and his programs of, through the Eastern Ghats Wildlife Society, Save the Snake sort of acts as like an umbrella to support his work and for his team's work to, you know, thus um, fulfill our mission to, you know, mitigate human snake conflict while protecting threatened snake species. And so that's sort of how it got started. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's a really good story. And it's, yeah, I was going to ask you later on to share some success stories that you've had. And that that's a good one for sure. And it's, it's good that, so the, these snakes, when they're, when they're caught and they're taken and re-released, they're, they're taken to a good wildlife location where they're, they're not going to, you know, maybe they find their way back to a community, but at least they're given an opportunity to thrive somewhere, I assume. Is that true? So, yeah. it, it's partially true. And so yeah. this is another really big problem um, that our organization and people in our network are seeing of this idea of relocating or translocation of snakes. Mm -hmm. um, snakes are, you know, we haven't really talked too much about snake ecology, mm -hmm. uh, but snakes are, they're pretty simple. Uh, <laughs> they, they have established home ranges, right? So they actually have their places they like to live. And if you look at how snakes move, which there are many studies about, you know, the movement of snakes and they're, you know, they really like their little areas. You know, uh. they know where their their water hole is. They know where their perfect feeding spots are. You know, they know where everything that they need is. And so the thing is, those snakes being relatively small animals um, have relatively small home ranges. And so if you take a snake, you know, a few kilometers or a few miles outside of its home range, what scientists have observed is that they quickly succumb to mortality. So oh, because yeah. what happens is a snake, when it goes outside of its home range, this is really sad. It, it just keeps looking for where you, it knows it's familiar. It's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm in California right now. If you just took me and dropped me in the middle of the, you know, Borneo rainforest without a <laughs> smartphone, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd be, you know, I'd get run over by a car. I'd get eaten by a predator. And right. the same, we see the same things that happen with snakes. Oh, that's and sad. Yeah. So that is sort of why a big part of our mission is living harmoniously with snakes. Okay. Well, now it's not like we're saying, hey, you got to live with king cobras, you know, in your house. But, you know, just as how we learn how to live with cars, to, to live in, you know, you know, if you think about how we have these dangerous vehicles around us at all times, we know how to live around them, right? Mm -hmm. They're a part of our everyday routine. The same could be said with living with snakes. For example, if you have snakes coming into your home it's like well why why are there snakes coming into your home in the first place it's like uh, okay maybe they're attracted to rats um and so snakes being predators you know they are quick to discover if you have a rodent problem um and so if we're messy with our our food you know they might be coming and getting those rats so get rid of the mice you're probably not going to have snakes but perhaps there's um debris or trash around that provides shelter for snakes clean it up you know keep grass mm -hmm. low Make it uh, make your home or where you it live or work not a good place for snakes. And so that way the snakes will not be around. There, there's no reason for them to come in your area. Because right. snakes are naturally very shy animals. And so these are part of our programs of just the, the awareness and living with these animals is, you know, keep your area, you know, kind of not very friendly for snakes. And then they will not come into those areas. Well, that's the idea. Because the alternative is if we release snakes far away, we pretty much think that that's a death sentence for snakes. Ah. Um, and that's something that there are so many studies now that that seems to be the case. There are some where you can find some good habitat for them. But the reality is, is that humane snake removal is greatly increasing because people are becoming more empathetic to the plight of snakes, right? They don't go, right. like, oh, I don't want to kill the snake. And so this humane snake removal is becoming very, very popular all over the world. But we need to have it based on science. And if we're moving snakes, you know, far away, it could be actually damaging uh, snake populations. And so that's something our organization is looking at um, and kind of uh, actually a segue back to India is that we are our long term goal for these programs in South India is to start the first King Cobra telemetry project um, in that region. There's only, oh. a, 
yeah, a few studies um, being done in the Western India and then in Thailand and Indonesia. There may be some in China as well um, or uh, South Asia around that area. But as far as we know, there have been none in wow. this huge region of India. I can't and so even... that's kind of our long-term goals. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say I can't even imagine how you would begin telemetry with a snake. But I'm sure you're going to tell us. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. I know. It's, it's like, right, because, you know, how do you, you know, with seals, you, you glue something on their head. You right. Know, with, uh, you know, with uh, tigers, you put collars on them. Snakes, it's difficult. Um, and so the only way that kind of works the best is that you actually have to surgically implant mm. a transmitter inside the body cavity of the snake. And then you basically, and they have an antenna that goes along their, their body wall. And then you can thus, basically everything's kind of in them, nice and safe. And the, this sounds terrible, I know. <laughs> but it's actually, snakes are really hardy animals. They're very tough. And uh, if you have a very well, um, you know, experienced surgeon that's able to do this or a vet, their mortality from this procedure is very low. And the information gained from these studies is so monumentally important Mm -hmm. Um, because the more we understand about how snakes use the environment, uh, the, you know, that's how we can actually learn about living with these animals or not. Um, And we have, um, you know, there's many, many studies that have greatly uh, increased uh, our knowledge of snakes based on how they move, um, you know, from South Asia to Arizona. So it's very, very important. But this reason, the reason it's so important in South India is because um, we think the population of king cobras is pretty small in this region of India. And this would give us an opportunity to further understand that population, how they're using this fragmented forest and how they're coping living with, you know, these these threats. And so it's it's all pretty exciting. And those are some of these long term big goals. And the only reason we could do this is because of these awareness programs, we have community members that are on board, they support the work, and they'll be the ones that are actually going to be conducting the work. And we're training some of these uh, community members to actually lead this these uh, future uh, projects by getting them involved, learning how to capture snakes, giving them the right information about you know snake ecology and conservation. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, all very, very exciting. That is, and that's that's the way to go. I mean, with any conservation effort, anybody who's living in these communities with these animals, whether it's tigers or lions or snakes or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I think they need to be the ones kind of taking the lead on on the conservation efforts of these. So, wow, that's pretty amazing. So, have you started getting uh, telemetry data back, or have, or, or well, is so this all new? Yet. Okay, <laughs> okay. So because that is that really is the long term. That's goal. what you want so, to do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. within we're hoping within five years. And so, you know, just a shout out if any of your listeners are, you know, multimillionaires. No. <laughs> Venture <laughs> um, capitalists. No. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, you know, we are partnering with zoos and other institutions to hopefully uh, with these programs. And so that's sort of why we started this 501c3. So we can make those partnerships to show some credibility um, and that we're serious about this work. Mm -hmm. And so we are, yeah, we're in the process of finding the funding uh, because we we have the the location. Murthy and his team have a great community in South India that are interested and eager for this project to begin. Um, We actually did start a a trial run of an economic livelihood program out there as well Mm -hmm. um, because that could could get started now. But getting a field base set up, that's, a little bit more of an investment that's going to require some substantial funding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interesting. So. Well, I know there's many ways that people can help, you know, they can go to your website. Um, how, any advice on how people, you know, there's donations and, and such, yeah. how, how can so, people help you? So there, there's many ways that people can help us. So one, obviously, you know, just, <laughs> telling people that snakes are great helps <laughs> yeah. because the only reason that save the snakes could exist is because in the West we have a growing community of people that love snakes that actually think about snakes. And, you know, whether that's from, you know, Steve Irwin, you know, enchanting yeah. our TV screens and granted there's a lot of, you know, you know, he has some of the stuff he did was not, maybe not so good, but he did, have snakes that were biting him in the face and he would talk about them being so beautiful. (laughs) So we have a culture now that actually either keeps snakes at home or is fascinated by snakes much more than it ever was. 
And so, but, so that means that those people will actually reach out and donate. You know, they're not just donating to pandas anymore, right? So they actually are care about what's happening to snakes in the wild and they want to conserve them. So by donating, spreading the word, we're actually, um, one way that we're looking to support our work is we actually launched an eco tour program. Oh, yeah. And so we're going to take a, a group down to Costa Rica uh, in early June 2019 to go actually learn about how Costa Rica is living harmoniously with snakes. Because not only is it um, they host one of the uh, largest producers of antivenom in the world, which will go visit the facility that makes the antivenom. But they also have incredible snake rescuers and we'll see lots of amazing snakes. So people could come and join that expedition to help support our international snake conservation efforts. Oh, interesting. How do they find yeah. out about that? Through your website or? Yeah, okay. just visiting, you know, save the snakes.org. Okay. Um, or just Google, yeah, save the snakes.org, Costa Rica 2019. Okay. Yeah. Or I... on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram as well. Okay, and I'll so. I'll definitely post all your information in the show notes so people can thank you listen. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that brings up a, a question, just a brief question. Um, you know, we talked about some challenges that snakes are facing the human wildlife conflict and fear and and such. And um, is is there any problem with the like snakes as pets? When you mentioned that that people are more people are having snakes as pets, is that an issue with snakes? The pet well, trade? Yeah, that's that's actually a, a very a good question, and it's it's controversial. I'll be completely okay. honest, yeah. because keep, keeping snakes as pets has exploded in yeah. the last decade, um, and arguably maybe the last two decades, um, where it was sort of like a subculture thing in the past. Now it really has exploded. Um, Luckily, the pet trade really is, um, I think, mostly being responsible um, because, for example, you know, having a captive bred snake, a uh, snake that was not taken out of the wild, um, is obviously better. And I'll give you an example. There's a very common snake um, in the pet trade called the ball python, which mm -hmm. you can find ball pythons there um, almost in every pet store. And now they have these kind of... Uh, designer morphs and such that make them more attractive to pet owners. Um, but ball pythons were almost wiped out um, from their native region of West Africa because of the over harvesting for the pet trade back, you know, you know, in the 90s and 80s and stuff. But because of captive breeding efforts, it's thus, you know, really halted that trade. And there's no reason to continue it. And so as long as a pet trade, you know, supports conservation, it, it tries to stop the wild caught um, issues and pet owners themselves are responsible um, you know I'm sure you've heard about the pythons in the Everglades yeah. Um, yeah that's you know we get asked that quite a bit you know it's like oh what about those snakes and you know unfortunately due to you know there there's debate whether those pythons originally got to the Everglades from being released from pet owners or from a hurricane which wiped out a large reptile um, uh, I guess like an importer exporter. So had many, many of these snakes, you know, hundreds of snakes were released. And thus that is why we have the Everglades Python problem, mm -hmm. but it's probably a combination of both. Um, and so that is an instance of, you know, in like, for example, we actually co-host a venomous for pathology symposium in this past year in 2018, we held it in Miami. And so we went out into the, you know, looking for reptiles and, we found some invasive stuff, you know, some animals like basilisks and uh, different lizard wow. species that are, you know, not native to South Florida, but because of the pet trade, they do come there. And it's, you know, I don't want us to be anti-pet trade. We're not. That's not mm -hmm. our position. We don't have a position on the pet trade. Yeah. Um, it's just we hope that the trade itself will remain responsible and people should know about what they're getting um, because we don't want to come into a cir circumstance where, you know, people are releasing their pet pythons in the Everglades. And the funny thing about that, where we have a python problem in the Everglades, mm -hmm. it's in their native range, Burmese pythons are endangered, uh -huh. right? You're right. Yeah. yeah, and so there are many projects right now that are actually studying python populations in their native range. And so it's, we don't, we don't want that, you know, that's not, that doesn't help biodiversity that, and so, but we can work together, you know, conservation groups and pet owners and the pet trade by being responsible and promoting conservation. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah. I, yeah, I work with a, or talk to a lot of 
you know, cat people and such. And, and the pet trade's a whole different story with that, with cheetahs. And yeah, whatnot. Ex- exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to ask about that. So it sounds like um, snakes can, like the python, breed in captivity okay. They're, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that there are, um, of, I will say, of pet owners, um, yeah. the reptile community, amphibian community, they are truly amazing yeah. uh, because they are very passionate about these animals. And they have learned so much about them that they have pioneered the breeding of them in captivity. And I'll give you an example again of uh, one of the really positive aspects of the pet trade is because the zoological institutions that are you know, typically thought to be responsible for captive breeding and securing bloodlines, mm-hmm. a lot of the information they have gathered from breeding these really critically endangered species come from private hobbyists. Mm. Um, because a zoological institution can only spend so many resources you know, to really learn what takes it, um, these animals to breed in captivity, which some, it's incredibly difficult. But private hobbyists, you know, that may actually work because they love those animals. They may work at a zoo. They spend their whole private lives learning how these animals tick. And thus, there have been incredible breakthroughs in the captive breeding of critically endangered iguana species, even some snakes. Um, and so that we can actually take those animals and then release them back out into the wild. Uh, um, and so there's a few programs like that at zoos, but a lot of that information is uh, gathered from private hobbyists as well. The zoos do really great work too, but I think there's a little bit of knowledge exchange, which I think is important to, yeah. to you know, to talk about. Yeah, that's but. interesting. Yeah, that's a different outlook on that. That's great. Mm-hmm. So awesome. So yeah. yeah, I have just two more questions if you still have time. And of um, okay. Yeah, just here in California, and this is kind of a question that came up in conversation. I don't know if it's unintelligent or not, but here in California, like I live up in the mountains, we deal a lot with rodenticide poisoning Mm. um, from rats, you know, so it's killing a lot of the owls and, you know, because they're eating the rats that are poisoned. And I assume that it's probably killing snakes, too, that are going after rats. Yeah. it's it's kind it's really hard to know, for example, if that is happening, but it likely it is. Yeah, um, you know, we don't because see we, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And snakes are they're an animal that are very is very cryptic, right? So they're hard to be found. And so if a a snake ingests a rodent that is filled with rodenticide, most likely it's going to die. Yeah. Um, but we just may see not see that evidence of it because I know that. At nature centers, quite often you'll you'll get these birds of prey that are acting weird, or right. um, or or even people's pets, you know, that ingest you know a rodent that has a rodenticide, and they they get really sick and both die. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, and so that's why we always advocate, you know, one of the best reasons to love snakes or at least respect snakes is they're a natural form of pest control, exactly. and they can go go places that birds of prey can't, right? You know, a barn owl, while they can eat, you know, so many rodents a year. You know, snakes can go to all those places that a barn owl can't, you know, down holes around the edges of barns. And, you know, they really are great, excellent um, pest control. And to give you an idea how bad these this mouse and rodent problems are, mm-hmm. uh, the University of Nebraska actually did a study. That, I think it was in 2011. It was, uh, they basically found that rodents uh, did about $20 million of damage annually to crops in the state of Nebraska. Wow. Um, you know, $20 million. And so you can think about if you had encouraged natural predators like owls and snakes, you could greatly reduce that cost. Yeah. And there are some, there are some examples. Um, there's um, an example in, I think it's Vietnam. I'm, of course, blanking on uh, exactly. <laughs> You'd have to look it up. But of just actually rice farmers that were, getting rat snakes and releasing them out into their rice paddies because they wanted that rodent control. You know, it's like they provide humans an ecological service and it's free. You know, what's not to like? (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and we're kind of doing the same education up here as you are, like, why are rats getting in your house or, you know, let's, mm-hmm. let's do a little cleanup and, you know, be, be mindful of how our house, you know, where they're coming in and seal those up and um, yeah. So, well, that's interesting. So my last question, and I ask all interviewees, this is, you know, what gives you hope of our future? We hear a lot of uh, bad news of 
things happening in the conservation realm. And there's so much work that you're doing that's positive and others, you know, so, so what do you see out there that gives you the most hope? You know what, that, that's actually a perfect question because there was one last thing that I wanted to, to leave <laughs> with your audience as well. Because um, I only really talked about what was happening in India and how we're supporting one project in India. Right. But when that, when that project took hold and we you know, developed an online presence, social media and a website, we got calls, well, emails and contacts through you know, instant messages and stuff like that from all over the world of people working on snake conservation projects. Um, so from Ghana to Mexico, um, down in Belize even, and Nepal, we had many uh, people within our first weeks of weeks of announcing our website, writing us saying, I need support my community. Um, I'm engaging my community to protect snakes and not kill snakes. Um, you know, can you help us or can you provide me more resources? Can you give me more training? Can you give me anything so that my project can grow? Great. And what, what we take from that is that there is a tremendous need for to support these projects to help people with their projects and so that's why save the snakes actually exists is to support these conservationists on the ground to protect snakes and to mitigate human snake populations and that gives me hope because we're we're seeing that there are so many people around the world that are doing something about it and as an organization we want to further support them so they can do their critically important wildlife conservation work and so it's just knowing that there is a community of people around that are also as passionate and inspired to protect these animals like myself and our, our team around the world now. Um, and so the way that we're doing that is we actually announced a grant program. It's the Save the Snake Support Grant. It's a very small seed grant funding, but we've uh, funded three projects in, in Kenya, Zambia and Colombia, actually. Mm. And so and we hope to uh, fund more projects in the future. And it's when it's only for a thousand dollars, but for these uh, individuals, that money really goes a long way. Right. And it's to them, it, it furthers them along, at least for a little bit more. Um, and so when there's so much happening in the world, um, it, it can be kind of tough and get down in the dumps. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I always think about my kind of like my, you know, big figure that <laughs> inspires me. And that's Jane Goodall. Right. And I got right. to ask that. That same question to Jane Goodall um, once at a, a, a um, an event, you know, what gives you hope? And then she pointed out that, yeah, everyone asks me that. I wrote a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's similar. And so we share. It's like what we see with, you know, traveling the world and her, you know, she travels 300 days a year. I'm quite fortunate to be able to travel as well to give presentations. I meet so many people that are working for wildlife conservation on the ground and i'm just thinking we have to be doing something yeah and you see it through all these you know collective people with their grassroots efforts and you know through technology we're learning about it and so it can't it can't not give you hope it has to yeah um but that being said we have to try harder you know yeah. because we are this is something that's not popular but wildlife conservationists are losing you know we are we, we are facing some very big tasks ahead of us and uh, hurdles that need to be addressed. Um, but with that being said, like, I'm very confident that we have a, a quite a many leaders in the conservation world that are making a difference. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to see, because working with snakes, a very underrepresented animal, that other species that are underrepresented are getting attention too. you know, from, mm -hmm. you know, pangolins to slow loris and and to other maybe, you know, uncharismatic species, amphibians, you know, there there are really some some leaders in those world leading those conservation efforts, which is very, very hopeful to see. That is hopeful. And I'm and I'm sure you're seeing and I am seeing a lot of uh, younger, younger, the next generations getting um, excited about animals and these different uh, species, you know, and, and you know, um, a lot more people interested in learning about whether it's cheetahs or pangolins or snakes mm -hmm. or frogs. And um, I think that's good too. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, gosh, that's great. Thank you. Very inspiring. And, you know, thank you for all the work you're doing and, you know, because it's not just snakes, it's, it's like making people aware of just the environment that snakes live in and, and helping communities live better lives too. So 
um, yeah, it's wonderful. So thank you for all you do. Well, well, thank you for helping us give snakes and the communities we support a voice. Uh, it's <laughs> it's very, very powerful. They need they need some good uh some good press. Thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio. Links and resources to today's topic are in our show notes on iTunes. We appreciate your dedication and interest in protecting our natural world for future generations. If you like what you heard, please get involved by volunteering, donating, and sharing these podcasts with your friends. It also helps us to inform more people if you take a minute to leave a rating or review on iTunes. Have a great day, and thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio.